there has been a great disturbance in the force. And by the force, I mean the self-publishing industry. What is that disturbance? A decline in the use of editors. I know, I know, I'm panicked about it too. I, the nonsense-free editor, kind of make money off of this. So when I start to see a series of posts on various social media, such as Twitter, I refuse to call it X, and most especially threads, indicating that authors, especially rapid release authors, are just simply not using editors. I have to take a pause and wonder, what is going on here? Has there been some great evolutionary leap where we've all improved to the point where we don't need another set of eyes on our books? I feel quite empowered to say no to that question. And I feel so empowered to say that because I just found out the hard way that actually, no, you can't skip editors. Now, what happened to shine a light on this particularly egregious phenomenon and also give me better insight into why it's happening in the first place? I will tell you. Hello, shameless writers. I'm Kristen McTiernan, the nonsense-free editor, at least for now, here bringing you your somewhat regular quarterly <laughs> update. I haven't been making videos recently. I'm so sorry. <laughs> in addition to being an editor and a ghostwriter, I am also an author in my own right. And I just released my first ever romantic suspense, paranormal romantic suspense, I should specify. It's called The Princess Pawn. Isn't that cover beautiful, you guys? I love it so much. Uh, the cover is fantastic the interior we're going to talk about. Now, as you all know, I've been an editor for well over 15 years. I do it in my day job. I do it on the side. And I've slowly been building my business over a series of, I think it, yeah, it's been 18 years now. Oh my God, I'm so old. So I love editing. I cut my teeth on editing. I do ghostwriting now. That's kind of a bigger moneymaker for me. But what has surprised me, I'm going to say in the past year, is that ghostwriting has become 80% of what I do. I get so few relatively editing jobs, maybe two a month, which is as low as it's ever been. And when I talk to people that I've worked with before, it's like, hey, did I lose your business? Is there another editor that's better? I'm going to say in eight out of 10 of the people that I've contacted, it's not that they went to another editor. It's that they stopped using editors at all. Now, this does not mean that no one is looking at their book before they just puke it out onto Amazon. That's not what's happening. What's happening is the writer's community is starting to see that, you know, um, the money for my books aren't really flowing in the way I would like them to. Typically, when I work with a first-time author, specifically if they're a ghostwriting client, the first question on their mind is, how long will it take me to make this money back? How long will it take me to not only break even on the money that I've invested into this book, but then to actually earn a living from it? And my response, typically, is... You probably won't make a living until you've had about three books, whether they are in a series or whether they are one-offs. Every single self-published author will tell you the same thing. It is highly, highly, highly unusual for you to have one book and it just hits it out of the park. You make money right away. People love it. Your marketing is on point and you make money back from your ads, from your cover, from all of the money that you sink into it and you make it back in the first year. Very unusual for one book. And cost is a primary reason that editing, I suspect, is on the decline. People instead are saying, okay, I have this amount of money to spend. What should I put into it? And what people are finding, and I'm not disagreeing with this, by the way, is that having a beautiful TikTok-worthy cover will sell more books than actually having a good typo-free book. That is a trend that I am finding. Additionally, and you may have found this when you're looking around, a lot of editors are raising their rates because um, I don't know if it's just an America thing. I'm pretty sure it's not. I'm pretty sure it's everywhere. But the economy is not doing great things right now. It is doing the opposite of great things. And I just paid my taxes and I, uh, I worked for free <laughs> for like half the year. That's so fun. It's so fun. I digress. Don't brag at me, people who live in the UAE and other places. I understand that your life is also, please don't brag to me. But money is tight. And a lot of times, first-time authors, particularly those who are working a day job that doesn't pay a whole lot, they think to themselves, okay, I am writing a high fantasy book. The cover requirements for fantasy 
I'm going to be honest with you guys. They're a lot higher than the cover requirements for a billionaire romance. This is just part of the genre. If you're doing military sci-fi, if you're doing high fantasy, I don't want to be sexist here, but like if you're leaning towards a primarily male leaning genre for I don't for whatever reason, the requirements of the cover seem to be a lot higher and it's not going to cut it to use stock photos. Putting aside cost for a moment, another reason that maybe authors aren't using editors as much as they used to is a factor of time. I, up until very recently, have been a one-person show. I did everything, all of my social media, all of my emails, all of the writing and editing and everything like that. I've recently hired on some new writers because it just got to be too much. There was, you know, a, an influx of clientele. So I had to hire on some writers to make sure that we could, you know, get the job done for everyone who wanted to do business with me. Great. But there's still a wait, isn't there? You can't just say, okay, well, I want to release my book in three weeks because I'm a rapid release author. I need you to edit this really quickly. I would love to. I would love to. But I can't. I'm all full up. Now, there may be some other editors who can get you in right away, or they will for an additional fee. So happy that they exist, and I hope that you find them. But can you find them? And are they any good? Do they have recommendations? Are there people that can vouch for them? Hiring an editor and forking over $1,200 to $2,000, that's a gamble, especially with a tight turnaround, especially when you don't know them and nobody that you're friends with knows them either. So you have an author and maybe not even a first-time author. Maybe this is an experienced author. And that little voice starts in their head and they say, you know what? You have done this so many times. You are a skilled author. Yes, there might be some typos when you put it out there to the world, but do readers really care about those? Honestly, no. Not real readers anyway. Those pretentious idiots who leave nothing but one-star reviews all over Goodreads? Screw you. Um, yeah, they complain about those. Let them complain. We know you don't read anyway. So after money considerations, after timing considerations... There's also the less common consideration of, I don't even want to call it ego. I want to call it disagreement. I recently had a back and forth with an editor over on Twitter. And this is one of those editors who goes through and removes all instances of the word that and all instances of M dashes. And they felt really good about themselves for doing that. And they had some things to say about authors who use them at all. As an author or a publisher or anyone who's kind of in a position of authority or knowledge over the author that you are working for, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes this can lead people to have an overestimation of the importance of their opinion. And that's just what it is. It's an opinion. For the record, that is not a bad word. You can't overuse it. I overuse it. That and so are my personal verbal tics. And a lot of them need to be cut. They absolutely do. But that doesn't mean that they can be done with entirely. Oh, and by the way, that and which are not interchangeable. So if you go through thinking you're a good person, getting rid of all the, all the that's and then just replacing them with which, you didn't do anything there, bro. No, you didn't. M dashes, likewise. You can overuse them. Yes. Yes, you can. Sometimes I overuse a lot, a lot. I overuse them. But that doesn't mean that you need to get rid of all of them. Sometimes commas would work better than those M dashes, but sometimes they wouldn't, especially with long sentences. When you're dealing with a positives, which is setting off a portion of the sentence, you know, that interrupts the overall sentence, commas work. So do M dashes. You don't have to get rid of all of them. And an editor who puts themselves in the position of saying, I know best, you know nothing, you listen to me. That's a huge turnoff for authors. And just from the rumblings I'm hearing and from hearing from my own previous clients and my current clients, it's becoming more um, common. And a lot of authors are like, I'm not making money for my books. Let me just go, you know, do some editing on the side. Not a bad thing. I'm not criticizing that choice, by the way, obviously. But if you've never edited before, if you've only worked in a group, Maybe you've always been overbearing and you just never realized it because who's going to point that out to you? Or maybe you've never been in a group at all and you don't realize that your personal preferences are just that. Preferences. They're not rules. So between the money, between the timing, and between the at least the common perception that editors can be overstepping and overbearing, 
there seems to be a lot more authors, particularly those who have several books under their belt already, who are foregoing editing altogether. They say, you know what? I've got a great street team. I have a team of beta readers. I have a critique group, which is what I have, which is what I used on my most recent book. That is enough. And maybe, maybe it is. But then sometimes maybe it's not. Not to make this too personal, but I found out for myself what happens when you just decide to skip an editor altogether because you don't have time. Like I say, I released The Prince's Pawn. It actually came out on Amazon yesterday, but it's been in my personal shop for over a month. It was very important to me to get it out in the first week of January. I wanted everyone to know, look, look, I had this new book. I said I would have one every month and I got it there on time because I'm a person of my word. I was so intent on that deadline, I decided to skip editing. I had an editor all lined up, Tethys Maiden, who works with me. She's a fantastic editor. She is a fantasy expert, and she actually reads all of the soppy romance that I am trying to at least partially emulate. Perfect editor. She's really great. But I didn't have time to send her my work, or at least that's what I told myself. So I just put it out in the shop, and I sent it to ARC readers. Now, my experience with the ARC readers was overwhelmingly positive. Generally speaking, they liked it. Some of the criticism was that, one, it felt rushed, Two, it was too short. I accept this criticism. I disagree with it. But that's just my personal thing. I hate when romances drag on with the will they, won't they, the miscommunication things. Those really irritate me. And it's why I have a hard time with romance. So obviously, because I hate those particular tropes, I didn't include them in my book. But a lot of romance readers really like those tropes, and I understand that they miss them. So it's perfectly valid. Another thing that the ARC readers found, and by the way, were very gracious about, Yes, typos. Minor typos. Always there. Not a big thing. But just full-blown sentences that didn't make any sense because I wrote them too quickly, because I did some cutting and pasting, and yeah, it looked fine to me because mentally I knew what it was supposed to say, but it didn't say that. There were a lot of parts in that book that made it just look like flat-out rushed rough draft, which kind of what it was. The nonsense-free editor skipped sending her book to the editor because she had a self-imposed deadline and guess what she produced subpar work the story is solid to be clear very proud of the story people like it i like it it's important to like your own work oh but this is kind of a ding on my reputation isn't it which brings me to my next point when i started the year off i had this idea that i was going to release a book a month which i can do i have writers working for me now so that's removed some of my freelance obligations. It frees up my time. I'm not working 12 hours a day anymore. Oh my God. But what I've found as I'm working on the sequel to The Prince's Pawn is, yeah, I can generate 50,000 words um, in a month, but I hate them. I hate them. They're not good. They're lazy. They're trite. And I don't feel good putting my name on this. And a person's name is really all we have. In particular, I had an exchange over on threads. I'm never there anymore, spoiler alert. But I was there, you know, at the beginning. And somebody mentioned that they can't stand reading long series, not because the series plot tapers off, but because it almost seems like the author stops trying and it becomes unreadable. And you can tell that they've stopped using an editor. They're rushing. They want one out once a month. They want to make that money. And let's be honest, who makes the money? the people who release most frequently. Those are the ones that Amazon pushes, the ones who are always on sale. They can do sales because they have a huge backlist, because they release every month, because they constantly get those, you know, first 30 days algo boosts from Amazon. It's, it's like a treadmill. And a lot of people think to their crazy selves, you know, we can sacrifice a little bit of quality. We can have a minimum viable product there's nothing wrong with that. This is just business. I'm making money. Why else am I being an author if not to make money? But when you're slapped in the face with a subpar product with your name on it, do you ever really recover from that? I mean, yeah, I can go into Amazon anytime and just upload a new interior file, which I had to do to get rid of those typos. <laughs> but the hit your reputation takes, particularly from a first-time reader, will that ever recover? I'm not sure. I'm really not. I hope that it will. I hope that if one of my books isn't for you, you would be willing to take an, a chance on another one. But it's not guaranteed. There's so many books out there. 
And if you have an unpleasant or even subpar experience with an author, why would you bother giving them a second chance? And honestly, as an author, I am of the opinion that I shouldn't have to ask you to give me a second chance. Which is why... Two things. One, I'm not doing a book a month. I can't. Some people can, and they can produce quality when they do it. That doesn't appear to be me. Okay, fair enough. I accept that reality, and I'm not going to bash my head against a concrete wall trying to make that happen and then push out something that I don't like. All right, there we are. The second thing I'm going to do, <laughs> and I hope this helps you, you guys, I have 50, 50 of these. They have the typos in them. They have the bad sentences in them. It's not pervasive. It's not every page. It's not even every chapter. But they're in there, and it chaps my behind. The ones on Amazon are $20. They don't have them in there. They have been fixed. The ebook is also available on Amazon if you're more of an ebook person. But if you are a paperback person and you love beautiful covers, for 50 of you, I have a marked down copy of The Prince's Pawn for you available in my shop. I believe there is a link for you to buy them right here on this uh, YouTube channel. I need to get rid of my shame. So if you want a beautiful and overall well-written book that is a romantic suspense, a paranormal romantic suspense about a woman with telekinetic powers who comes to the attention of an Arab prince who just has some maybe not so virtuous ideas about how he can use those powers for himself and for his uh, fictional Islamic kingdom, then you might like the book, especially if you can overlook a few typos. And there are a few. And if nothing else, I have learned my lesson. Editing is not optional. If you need to push a date back, push it back. Because there are things that another set of eyes will catch that you never will. I submitted this, the first half. I submitted the first half to my critique group. And their critiques were marvelous. But your critique group is not your editors. They're not going to go through and nitpick and fix all of your typos. That's not their job. They're there to check your story. And they did it magnificently. But they're not an editor. I need my editor. You need your editor. Not necessarily me, but somebody. Somebody who is dedicated to finding those small mistakes, to finding where you had those um, cut and paste issues, we'll call them. So my advice hasn't changed. Work within the budget you have. If you need a newer or less experienced editor to make that work with your money, then do that. Awesome. Exchange services if you can. But don't skip it entirely. Don't be like me. If you were triggered by that thumbnail, um, that picture is not you. It's me. I'm the drooling Wojak. There. I've confessed. So that's my video for this week and my public mea culpa. If you would like the error-free version of The Prince's Pawn, you may get that on Amazon as of today. And if, like me, you need someone to look over your work who's not an editor but will check your story, then, of course, there is also a link to my critique group below in the description. So until next time, take care and write well. And hire an editor.